Hello, hello, hello guys, and welcome back to Joe's Ventures, and today, after about a month, we've been letting those mods piling up a little bit for both Jurassic World Evolution 2 and Planet Zoo, so I thought we'd go back into Planet Zoo for a hot minute. So this will be our 43rd one, with a bunch of cool new animals, so I know that we're probably going to get a pack in December, don't know what it is yet, but we'll uh, make sure that we keep on track and on top of it, so... We are going to be starting off with some fish. We've got some cool fish today. We're going to be starting off with the clown triggerfish, or the uh, big spotted triggerfish. That you can see here. By Seth, Buffsu, and Eline Media. So that is the company that made Beyond Blue. Came out really wonderfully. So this is the clown triggerfish, or Ballastone's, um Colossillum, I believe that's you pronounce the scientific name. So they are a triggerfish, so that's a group of fish that look like this. Or their family name is the um, Bastillidae. So the clown triggerfish get to about 50 centimeters long, or about 19.7 inches, and have this really, really stocky appearance and seem to be compressed laterally. So that means they are quite flat on their sides, like that, which helps them obviously swim. They also are pretty, head is pretty large, and it also represents about a third of their body length. And they have, you can see these mouth is small, but they have quite strong teeth. So, um, you can see their base coloration here is like a um, black with some big uh, white spots, also some yellowish going along the patternings and stuff, so really, really interesting. Also got these really cool dorsal patterns, uh, like the black going on here, it looks really, really wonderful. Very, very unique looking fish. So... They uh, occur all across the Indian and the West Pacific Ocean in, a, in tropical and subtropical waters. They are most commonly found in uh, external reef slopes in clear water that are about up to 75 meters in depth, so not really too big. But juveniles usually uh, stay, below, stay below about 20 centimeters, uh, not centimeters, 20 meters, uh, so they hang out in sheltered caves and overhangs and things like that. And the feeding of these guys, they have quite a varied diet. They feed a lot on benthic organisms, so things like echinoderms, so that includes like uh, mollusks as well, uh, crustaceans, so crabs, uh, worms, pretty much anything that's got uh, even um, urchins sometimes. Uh, that's what they're specially adapted to eat. They've got these very powerful jaws and powerful teeth to be able to crush them, pretty much be able to crush anything. I think they're all hanging out in the land at the moment. We'll have a look. This is the uh, male, I believe. And then we can see this is the female. Oh, that, no, the other one's the male. So that's a female. This is the male. Very, very interesting colors, isn't they? Very, very cool. So they are diurnal in um, during the day. And they are solitary. So they defend a territory. And they can be very aggressive with other fish and other members of the species. So that's kind of hard to keep them in a the tank. Um, you can see the first uh, long dorsal uh, spine, when it's erect, is used to kind of like a, avoid, a pre um, impress an opponent, so it says, Oh, look at me, I'm so cool. Or it will avoid a predator to, um, when it pulls out of its refuge. So it'll be like, nah, uh, leave me in, I'm staying in my hole, you're not getting me. Really, really wonderful animal there. So they are a highly prized um, aquarium fish because of their attractive colors and their interesting look. But like other trigger fish, as I mentioned, they can be quite aggressive, so they should not be kept with small fish. They'll also prey on invertebrates in the aquarium, so you shouldn't be housing invertebrates in there with them. And um, these fish can be tame enough to be hand-fed, so you've got to be very careful uh, with their sharp teeth, but otherwise uh, can be tamed so, and trained, so I think that's really, really cool. A really wonderful job uh, with this first mod, so we're going to move on to one fish to another fish. One fish, two fish. So we're going to be moving on to another wonderful guy here. So this one was done by Buffsu, Genora Pizza, and Bit Golem. We have got the... I'm going to see if any in the water. I don't think I'm going in the water yet, but we have got here the red-tailed catfish. It's a very interesting guy. So the red-tailed catfish, or Facto um, uh, Caliphus, uh, Emulopterus, I believe how you pronounce that. Scientific names are weird like that, which is a type of um, long whiskered catfish, which is known as the Pirara in Brazil, uh, and is comes from the Tupi language, and is the only member of its genus, which is Phalacticephalus, I believe I pronounced that. 
And it's also common in the pit trade, but obviously their massive size uh, is a bit of a variant to that. So, they are pretty big fish. They can reach up to 1.8 meters or 5 feet 11 inches and weigh at about 80 kilograms or 180 pounds in weight. However, this is exceptionally rare and on average they tend to get about 3 feet to four, 3 feet 6 inches to 4 feet 6 inches, so 1.1 to 1.4 meters in length generally and get a little bit less than that. And they're very, very colorful as you can see. They've got like this brownish color on their back with all these little darker splotches. And um, they have also got, obviously where they get the name, the red tail catfish, is that they've got red detailing, especially on their fins here, on their caudal fin. And uh, also a lot of their dorsal fin and the uh, pelvic fin and all that. Very, very interesting. So that really helps uh, give them a renewed look and kind of helps make them a very popular aquarium fish, even though they definitely should not be. And um, they've also got these very, very long whiskers here that are full with um, chemo receptions uh, cells. So they could use them as like a sense of smell and use them to detect things. Uh, so they can detect chemicals in the water. And um, they also. Uh, breed using external fertilizations uh, after they lay their eggs and they communicate by making a clicking sound to uh, warn off potential predators so that's very very interesting so in terms of their habitat they pretty much live all across uh, uh, tropical basins so the Orinoco Basin the Amazon and the Espanquillo basins of South America so they live in Venezuela Ecuador Bolivia Brazil uh, Peru Colombia places like that all those tropical countries and are found only in freshwater and inhabit large uh, rivers, streams and lakes. And they tend to eat during the evening and night and stay motionless during the day. And tend to be, as most catfish, uh, bottom dwellers. So they tend to move quite slowly. And they are quite territorial as well. So they'll defend their uh, patch of land from other um, catfish. So they are very very large and they have been considered a game fish by anglers and the current record is about 56 kilos for a really really big uh, caught angler but they can get bigger and they say the um, natives do not eat the meat of the catfish because it's black and has been actually introduced by uh, humans in Thailand even though they're not native to Thailand at all uh, but, and species uh, along with uh, common plecos and alligator gars and have been uh, basically an invasive species there now and should be eradicated. Let's see if we can find other. Is there any one of them swimming? You're going on the other side, buddy. I want to see more swims. Come on. Be a homie. You're just vibing. Anyway, so they're extremely popular fish in like Amazonian themed tanks, especially in aquariums because they are so big and they're from the Amazon. That's like a biotope type thing. And can be hos housed with other big fish. But they uh, got to be careful of things smaller than them. But um, the juveniles are often available like for sale for normal people. Um, but then they get so big and so rapid, no one can keep up with it. So it turns out they get all abused a lot, which is very, very sad. And the recommended size for an adult fish is about 10,000 um, liters or about 2,600 US gallons when it's fully adult. So most people cannot afford a tank that big or have the space for a tank that big so if you cannot provide for an adult fish you shouldn't get one and um, weekly feedings is also appropriate and overfeeding can be quite a common cause of death since um, often people like to overfeed things because it's obviously a pet um, it feeds uh, heavily on live and dead fish other meats as well and even a juvenile will be able to swallow like tetras and guppies so you got to be very very careful with that and they also have a habit of swallowing in, uh, inedible objects in the aquarium that are often regurgitated, uh, both by swallowing and the regurgitation presents a problem to fish and are best kept out of the aquarium. So anything you kind of you can't eat and it can pick up, you should probably try and avoid it. They've also been known to hybridize with other fish, such as the tiger shovel nose catfish, and of uh, through the use of hormones. And they can create the tiger red tail catfish, which is a hybrid fish that can be found in the hobby, which is really really interesting. Having a bit of fun in there. Let's see where the other one is. Let's have a look at you. You guys are not really going for a swim, are you? Really, really wonderful fish. I love red tail catfish. So now we're going to be moving on to uh, another animal. So that was by Buffsu, uh, Genora Pizza, and Bit Golem. We're going to be moving on to another big, big bad fish. A really, really cool animal. So this one was done by Buffsu, Genora Pizza, and Deep Silver. So this was ordered from a different model. Let's see if you can find them here. Here we are. 
in the water for a change, we have got the large tooth sawfish. So the large tooth sawfish is a species of sawfish, obviously, <laughs> that comes from tropical and subtropical regions uh, all over the world, but also freshwater where they breed. And they are sadly considered uh, critically endangered. So they are the largest of them. They're obviously the large tooth. Uh, they can be found pretty much all over these areas and they can get huge. A large uh, tooth sawfish can potentially reach up to 7.5 meters or 25 feet in length. But the largest confirmed was a West African individual that got to uh, 7 meters or 23 feet in length. And also an individual that was caught in Texas, which was documented in film but not measured, had been estimated to be a similar size. So today, because of obviously hunting and things, most individuals are far smaller and typically attain lengths of two to two and a half meters. And large individuals may weigh, weigh between uh, 500 and 600 kilograms or uh, 1,102 to 1,323 pounds and uh, all potentially even more. Let's see. Oh, they didn't want to stay in the water for me. Wonderful, wonderful little animals here. Well, not little, they're huge. So, um, obviously they get their name the sawfin because uh, sawtooth. So they have these really, really huge uh, uh, noses that you can see here. The dorsal fin also has a pretty uh, recognizable uh, profile. Stitch by eye. They also kind of look like a skate. They've got relatively long uh, pectoral fins and like that, like other sawfish. Not too different, mainly just much bigger. And um, obviously you can see the long saw. That they've got this long mouth with the saw. It's not technically their mouth, it's kind of like their rostrum. And um, it's got these spikes on them that are teeth, so that's why they get the name saw tooth, because it looks like a saw that you'd cut a tree with. And um, as I mentioned, they can be found worldwide, and they enter freshwater... Uh, uh, places to breed uh, historically they used to live in Angola and places like that the old reports from the Mediterranean had been just cut, uh, considered vagrants but they suggest that may have been a breeding population there in the West Atlantic they range from the Gulf of Mexico to the Caribbean to Uruguay and there also been several reports of them living in the Gulf Coast states uh, Gulf, Co uh, Gulf Coast states in the US so like Texas Mexico um, Florida and there have been like reports, as I mentioned, from Texas and um, Florida. Also, that could have been imported, but it is what it is. Um, those are also found in the East Pacific uh, range. They range from Peru to Mexico. And historically, it was widespread through the Indo-Pacific. That ranged from the Horn of Africa in South Africa, through India, Southeast Asia, and into Northern Australia, where it still lives today as well. And a total distribution cost uh, covers about... Se um, 7,200,000 uh, 7, kilometers, or very, very huge amount of space, uh, and it's more than any other species of sawfish, but has disappeared from most of its range, so that's very, very sad. That's why they're considered critically endangered. So they are primarily found in estuaries and marine waters at a depth of about 25 meters, but mostly less than 10, and they kind of do their own thing, uh, try and hang out in these different areas. So they reach sexual maturity at about uh, 2.8 to 3 me uh, meters, uh, or 9.2 to 9.8 feet, and about 7 to 10 years of age. Let me have a look at his little babies while we're talking about them. Let's have a look at the babies. Look at the little baby man. Baby man. Baby. So, breeding is seasonal, and they're opoviviparous. Uh, so that means they will carry the eggs in their body. But the exact time depends on the region. An adult female can breed every 1 to 2 years, and the gestation period is about 5 months. But there's indications that mothers actually return to the regions where they were born to give birth. Some of them are like our salmon door, so that's very, very cool. They have on average 1 to 13, uh, well, they have 1 to 13 babies. Average is about 7 in each litter, which are about 72 to 90 centimeters at birth. They are typically born in salt or brackish waters, but move into fresh water and spend the first 3 to 5 years of their life in freshwater streams. Uh, sometimes as much as 400 kilometers up river, or 250 miles. In the Amazon Basin, they actually have been reported there, and most of these include young individuals up to under 2 meters. Uh, occasionally, young individuals have been isolated in ponds during floods and lived there for years. And the estimated possible lifespans for these guys uh, suggest between 30 and 80 years, so a very, very long lifespan. 
And also they are a predator, so they feed on fish, mollusks, crustaceans, and they use the saw that they have there. It's not for cutting through uh, prey, things like that. It's used to stir up the bottom of the, uh, like the silt in the bottom of rivers and uh, estuaries and things that they use to uh, stir up and try and find prey, and, which is very, very interesting. And uh, they're actually pretty docile and harmless to humans, but if you, except when they're captured, so you've got to be very careful when you catch one, as their saw could really, really hurt you. So, yeah, as I mentioned, they are um, critically endangered, sadly. And the main threats has been because of overfishing and habitat loss, because used for shark fin soup, and also their saw has been prone to getting tangled in fishing nets. And historically, um, they used to hunt them for their saws as well, but that obviously didn't uh, contribute too much because it's only a few native peoples uh, hunting them, so it doesn't really do too much to their population. So the large toothed sawfish has been uh, extirpated from uh, most of the areas where they used to live. So among the 75 countries that they used to live in, they've disappeared from 28 and may have disappeared from another 27. So it really only leaves about 20 countries they still live in, which uh, really only Australia has a relatively healthy population of this species and may be the last remaining population in the entire Indo-Pacific uh, Indo that is uh, viable uh, and a good size. And even that has been experiencing decline, so it's very, very sad. Other areas such as Papua New Guinea and the Amazon has another population, so it's very... They are, they are critically endangered. The populations are declining everywhere, mainly because of fishing, but it seems that there are some strongholds, at least uh, across the world. So they do have a quite a varied range, so that does help. So luckily, they all are, all are considered uh, CITES-1 by the IUCN and covered under the Endangered Species Act, so they are protected in pretty much all of their remaining range, so that's very, very good. And they're also quite popular in aquariums, and uh, stud books show that there's about uh, 16 individuals in American zoos, uh, 5 individuals in European zoos, and about 13 in Australian zoos and aquariums, of course. And others are kept as public areas in Asia, so that's pretty, pretty cool. So, yeah, really, really wonderful animals here. We've got... Uh, Done with fish, so that was again by uh, Buff Zoo, Genoa Pizza, and Deep Silver. Now we're going to move on from the fish. We've got some mammals on the go, which is very, very wonderful. So we have got the Francoise Alangueur. Very, very cool uh, monkey. That was done by Buff Zoo, uh, not Buff Zoo, um, uh, Bubbly Wums or Jen. Either or is kind of the correct one. And Leaf. So the Francoise Langueur, or course also called the token leaf monkey, or the white side burned black langueur, is a species of uh, lutang and is a type species of its group, and it's one actually one of the least studied species of its family. Um, they are distributed throughout southwestern China and to northeastern Vietnam, and the total population is unknown, but it's believed to be fewer than 500 uh, in Vietnam and less than about uh, 2,000 in China. And about 60 are about in house activity in North American zoos. Very, very interesting. So as you can see here, they're a medium-sized primate. They have this quite black silky hair and have these very distinctive sideburns, as you can see here. Gives them their name. And this is for the males. And they also show sexual dimorphism. So the species show sexual dimorphism with the male having a head to body length of about 55 to 64 centimeters, or 22 to 25 inches, while females are only about 47 to 59 or about 90 to 23 inches so that's pretty similar males also have longer tails with 82 to 96 centimeters or 32 to 38 inches compared to a 74 to 89 uh, centimeter or 29 to 35 inch tail for the females and the males are also significantly heavier so males will get about 6.5 to 7.2 kilos or about 14 to 16 pounds a female will become uh, about 5.5 to 5.9 kilograms, or 12 to 13, so it's a bit bigger. Um, and the infants, when they're born, is about 0.45 to 0.50 kilograms, or 16 to 18 ounces at birth. And you can see, so we'll talk about the little babies here. A really, really wonderful little fella. So the little guys are born with like this really bright... We'll have a look at you, Robert. Since you're in the sun. So you can see they're born with this quite bright um, orange fur color. And it usually fades throughout um, into black as they uh, grow up uh, over seven months. And it's no, not really known how they, um, why they keep their coats different, but it may be to grab attention. So they're bright colors think, oh, baby, you know, that's kind of what it thinks. Maybe camouflage as well. 
Um, so they are diurnal species, so that means they are active during the day, like most other monkeys. And they will spend most of the day foraging, and estimates show that they'll spend a lot of their time resting, uh, foraging, grooming, like that. Uh, hanging out with each other, doing all sorts of things, all the group behaviors as well. And they tend to live in groups of about 4 to 27 langues, and but can average about 12. They live in a matriarchal society where the females lead the group and where and the females will share the um, par parenting responsibilities with one another. So they'll kind of, t but the males will take no uh, part in raising the young, and the young males leave the group at about sexual maturity. And young langues are nursed for about uh, two years before they're weaned, and once weaned, the relationship among the relatives becomes that of any other member of the group. So their diet mainly also consists of leaves, so fruits, seeds, uh, occasionally minerals and insects as well, stems, roots, bark, pretty much whatever they can get their mouths around in terms of uh, fruits and plants they will. So um, they live in this uh, food habitat of a cassert um, topography, so they're like limestone cliffs and caves of tropical and subtropical zones. By living in these limestone cliffs, they have the advantage of when it comes to sleeping arrangements because they can sleep on ledges or in caves. They've also been known to find sleeping sites in areas that are above 60 degrees Fahrenheit or about 60 degrees Celsius within evergreen forests, and they can able to use this to uh, reduce the rate of predation, so it's kind of a way that they do. They also ex uh, exhibit cryptic behaviors and become very vigilant upon entering the cave, so they try to find any predators, so that's really, really cool. And they'll use calls to kind of demonstrate their territory and kind of um, ch change their sleeping habits depending on the availability of food. So um, sleeping is also not located in the heart of foraging sites, but also within reasonable proximity. So they try to keep themselves as safe as possible, but they use caves and things, so that's really, really interesting. Uh, let's see... Let's see if we can get one climbing. This one's climbing. Oh no. Monkey, 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 monkey. I like monkey. Really, really wonderful. So, so they are, due to this like habit, they can really only be found in certain areas, so they really can only be found in southwestern China and north of Vietnam. And the majority of their studies have been taking place in China, and their average home range is about 19 hectares, and the day will range about 341 to 577 meters. In general, the low quality of its diet um, can lead to stress, and smaller uh, home ranges and reduced day travel. So the largest group of landers reported has been 500 to 600 individuals in the Mengji National Nature Reserve, and the average group ranges from 4 to 27. And it seems that their population has greatly declined, uh, up to 73% in the past five years. That's why they are considered endangered, and potentially could be critically endangered. So the population, as I mentioned, had a steady decline, and mainly because of hunting, uh, also habitat destruction, since, as I mentioned, they have a very, very specific habitat. Uh, they live on these limestone cat cliffs, and when the farmers will look to cultivate their land, they tend to fire... Um, and these and these uh, slopes, which are limestone, are susceptible to fire, which can cause destruction of their habitat. They also get exposed to predators that way, since they have nowhere to hide. And there have been some very big conservation e e uh, efforts to, um, to protect these guys, such as the Conservation Action Plan, which has yet to be implemented, but they're trying their best to get it in. But um, yeah, it seems that they are kind of getting some protections at least. Hopefully their populations can increase because they're very, very wonderful animals. We just don't want to. We don't want a world without our langurs because I like a good langur. So yeah, I think they did a really wonderful job. Is this a male? I want to see a female. Females are not that different. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to move it on to another animal. So this has been coming with the uh, <laughs> North America pack. So very, very interesting animal here. So this one was done by Leaf and uh, Mega Rex Gaming. So we have got, oh, wrong way. We have got the Nutra, also called as the Koyopu. So they are a large semi aquatic rodent that live in, they are kind of related to the only member of its family, Masconidae, uh, but has also been found to be related to spiny rats. So they live in uh, burrows alongside stretches of water and feed on plant stems. And they are native to the uh, lower parts of South America, the subtropical and temperate ranges of that area. 
but have been introduced to places all across the world because of fur um, trade and um, trapping. So places like North America, Africa, Asia, and Europe. And they also, although they are still hunted for these regions, they are very destructive and come into conflict with humans. So they are classed as an invasive species. So, yeah. They are a very, very, they look like, the two ways you can describe them is either like this here, very, very large rat, or a beaver with a small tail. Go and have a look at one swimming. Really, really wonderful animal we've got going here, don't we? So, um, yeah. Adults could typically reach around 4 to 9 kilograms, or 9 to 20 pounds, or about 40 to 60 centimeters, or 16 to 24 inches in body length, with a 30 to 45 or 12 to 18 inch tail. It is possible for them to get even larger, about 16 to 17 kilograms, or 35 to 37 pounds, although adults usually average about 4 to 5 to 7. You can see they have this white coarse brown hair, also um, with these white patches on the muzzle, as you can see here. Also, they have like yellow or addition sizes, and uh, which is pretty, pretty interesting. And interesting as well is that the nipples of the female, they are quite high on her flanks, so the babies can feed on her while she's underwater. So it's very, very interesting. And they often get confused for muskrats, even though they uh, live in completely different areas. But there have been some introduced populations of koibu in um, North America. Uh, there's lots of differences between them. So... They have a relatively long life for a rodent. They can live up to six years in captivity, but uncommonly live past three years in uh, the wild. It seems that 80% of them will die in their first year and 15% will live over three years. So rough life for a koku. And they reach sexual maturity about as four months old and females as early as three months, but they can also have a prolonged adolescence up to nine months. Uh, and a female is pregnant, gestation will usually last about 130 days. And she may give birth to as few as, uh, or as many as 13 off uh, 1 to 13 offspring. And they'll generally lie in nursery nests with grasses and soft reeds. And what's very interesting as well is that they are born at precocial. So that means the babies are born like with their eyes open and they're fully furred so they can just go out and eat vegetation within hours of birth. And the female koapu can become pregnant after the day she gives birth, pretty much. So she's ready to go right after that. And um, if timed properly, you can get a pregnant uh, koapu three times in the year. So you could get her pregnant if you timed it right three times. And um, newborn koapus nurse for about seven to eight weeks. And after that, they leave their mother. And um, in terms of their habitat, they breed pretty quickly. Uh, they eat large amount of vegetation, so an individual, an individual will consume about 25% of its body weight daily and feeds you around. And being one of the largest extant rodents, so comparable to like beavers and capybaras, a uh, healthy who average eats about average about 5.4 kilograms or 11 pounds uh, 14 ounces uh, in weight and can reach as much as 10 uh, kilos or 22. So it's very, very interesting. They'll mainly eat the above ground stems of plants such as uh, like softer things and things like that. And the most commonly found in uh, freshwater marshes can be found in brackish and salty marshes where they construct their own burrows or move into burrows made by uh, muskrats or other animals or beavers like that. And they're also capable of constructing floating rafts out of vegetation, which is also pretty, pretty cool. So the reason they were spread is um, local extinctions has happened in their range because of the harvesting. Uh, but in the late 19th to 20th century and the first farms were kind of uh, in Argentina then spread out to the world and it seems they have pretty much discovered from that they were also introduced into Louisiana in the 1930s which escaped from fur farms and they have spread throughout the south, uh, southern United States which has been wrecking a lot of uh, well, wetlands and which is very very bad let's have a look at this guy sleeping oh this gal actually but also around the world, they've been introduced in uh, the United Kingdom, also Louisiana, and uh, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, they've been introduced, so a lot of areas. They also carry uh, a nematode parasite that can infect both uh, humans as well. So they are a very, very bad invasive species, not because of the damage, not just because of the damage they do to the environment, they put human health at risk, so yeah, not very good. So na their natural range is about uh, South America. So they can be found, they're actually regionally extinct in Scandinavia as well. And uh, Idaho, Montana, and Nebraska since the 1980s. 
but the wild population pretty much lives in Argentina, the lower part of the um, uh, South America. So a lot of that before we kind of you reach the Amazon, like a bit under that. So yeah, they also, as I mentioned, they eat a lot of plants that destroy wetlands and also um, kind of shake things up and really just do bad things for. Um, wetlands because wetlands are very important they trap carbon they filter water for us and um yeah they need to be protected but these guys kind of just go through and destroy them because they are unchecked but luckily they are controlled in places such as new zealand they're a prohibited organism in new zealand uh they've been kind of almost eradicated in britain uh europe they're trying to work on ways to uh get rid of their population same with uh, america so yeah really we could potentially have Nutra's gone in the next uh, few decades from where they're not meant to be. So that's pretty, pretty cool. Really, really interesting animal. Again, made by Mega Rex Gaming and Leaf. Next one, we have got a remake, so I won't go too much into detail about these guys. So we have got a wonderful emu done by Leaf, Mega Rex Gaming, and a good boy. So I've already done the original mod, but this is obviously the remade one. It looks so good. So we're going to just quickly go over some general facts about um, emu. So they are the second largest uh, living bird in height uh, to the ostrich and are endemic to Australia. And they are found in all sorts of different areas of Australia. They range most of uh, mainland Australia, but there have been some subspecies or species, depending who you ask, uh, from Tasmania, Kangaroo uh, Island and the King Island subspecies when extinct after European settlement in 181788. So you can see these guys are quite the soft feathered and brown large flightless birds with uh, long necks and legs and can reach about 6.6 uh, 6 feet 2 or 1.9 meters tall and um, emus can travel great distances and when necessary they can sprint uh, at 50 kilometers an hour so they're very very fast. They forage on a wide variety of plants and insects, uh, they're big grazers. They will, and have been known to go from weeks about without eating. They also drink infrequently, but they take copious amounts of water when the time arrives. So this is the female. I want to see the male. The females are larger than the male. The female kind of does her own thing, and the male's left to take care of the eggs. Really, really wonderful animal you got here. So for these guys, breeding will take place during May and June, and fighting among females for a mate is common. So. Emus and other ratites, kiwis as well, ostriches, will often do things the other way around. The female is the larger one and she will compete for the males because the males will um, mate with several males and the males will kind of take care of the eggs, which works well for them. They seem to be doing well. So females can mate uh, several times and lay several clutches of eggs in one season. So the male will do the incubating and kind of do his own thing. So he will uh, hardly eat or drink and he loses a lot of weight, but he sits on the eggs, keeps them warm like a good dad. And um, the eggs will hatch after about eight weeks and the young are nurtured by the fathers. So the father will take the young and take them under his wing, so to speak, obviously bird puns, and um, take care of them. Really, really cute little guys here. And um, they reach, <laughs> they reach about um, they reach full size at about six months but they can remain as a family unit until the next breeding season so they might stay together until they need some more uh, until they get amorous and then they might have to go their own separate ways uh, we'll have a look at this uh, wonderful emu here um, and they have become a real cultural icon of Australia which appears on the coat of arms and they also uh, feature prominently in a lot of indigenous Aboriginal mytho uh, mythologies and stuff, which is really, really cool. Um, they're also good eating as well. And, and they're very, very common. That's why they're considered least concerned. Though other, some local populations such as uh, have been endangered and the subspecies such as the Tasmanian emu have gone extinct. Though the threats mainly to these guys that include predation uh, of the eggs, uh, road kills, and fragmentation of the habitat. That's something that affects even some of the most common species. But yeah, they are really, really wonderful animals, I think. And um, yeah, good eating as well. Very, very wonderful animals. And good for penning zoos. They're quite a common zoo animal. Uh, really, really wonderful. So yeah, we're going to move on from the emus. That was done by Mega Rex Gaming, Leaf, and Gaboy. You know Gaboy for doing all those wonderful uh, other species. Um, 
So next we're going to move on to Narwhaler. Now Narwhaler we haven't seen in a hot minute, but he has come up with a Siberian Muscadia. So very, very interesting little animal here. So let me just get that to load. So the Siberian Muscadia, you can see this is the female, yep. Uh, the Siberian Muscadia is found in the mountainous forests of Northeast Asia and can be found in the tigers of Southern Siberia, also found in Mongolia, uh, and the Korean Peninsula, places like that. They have these small size that they use to avoid predators and things, and they're incredibly fast. And you can see they're quite famous for carrying these huge fangs that you can see here. Even though they look dangerous, uh, they're actually herbivorous, and their main source of nutrients is from lichens. And their population is generally declining. It's reduced by 30% over the past three generations. So that's why they are considered vulnerable. And um, yeah, they are, as I mentioned, found uh, the earliest findings of must there and from the upper and middle Pleistocene show that they come from all China and south of the Soviet Far East. But they now live in about montane forests in Eastern Asia, as well as uh, Central Asia, also in the Siber uh, Siberia as well. So they're quite common. So we'll talk a little about their babies. Where's the baby there? So it takes approximately a year for a Siberian musk deer to reach maturity with the average deer living about 10 to 14 years. And during uh, the breeding season, the males will have grow these wonderful big teeth or tusks instead of antlers that you see here. So you've got these wonderful big tusks. Instead of antlers, they'll grow these big tusks. Uh, these tusks are used for combat with other males and to attract females. And the tusks that are longer and stronger create a more intimidating stance and become more attractive to the females as they are an indication that babies will be healthier. So once the male and female deer have procreated, these guys will obviously bump uglies and make a baby. The female will be pregnant for over six months and she can give birth between one to three offspring. So usually from the months of May to June. And um, they will mark their territories, uh, warning trespassers and uh, not to come past. So when they mark their territory, they will gather fallen branches, plant stems and trunk and pass them in a circle. They will also uh, use an, do an olfactory examination. So they pretty much smell and turn their bodies to, uh, towards the marked territories. They'll also defecate or poo to mark territories or also to claim unmarked territories. So it's kind of just to say this is my land. <laughs> So, um, yeah, they are generally nocturnal and they live in these mountainous taiga biomes and they can be um, uh, found in these rocky crevices and things and they're actually preyed upon by many animals such as lynx and wolverines. They have a preferred diet for easily digestible uh, nutritious foods that is both rich in protein and low in fiber. So they can survive on poor diets, of course. And then most of their diet consists of lichens, pine needles, leaves, and tree barks. And during the winter, 99% of their diet is lichen. And they do have a pre preference for easily digestible foods. As I mentioned, they're largely nocturnal and they prefer to live in altitudes more than 2,600 meters. And adults can weigh between 7 and 17 kilograms. Uh, they are considered vulnerable. And a lot of these threats include, obviously, uh, hunting, uh, also for uh, the domestic trade. And they've been cited in other areas as well. Deforestation is a big issue because China cut down more forests than it replant. Uh, which is very, very uh, interesting. It seems uh, it's a very severe threat because they can only live a few years uh, in the few areas. So that's very dangerous. But they are considered vulnerable, but they are slowly declining. So in Russia, they are protected and uh, also in protected by other places. And they're also high on sighting, CITES. So they are quite the uh, managed. So hopefully their populations aren't going too bad. They're not declining too heavily. It's so about 30%. But um, that's still a worry sign. You don't want any population declining, really. So, yeah. Really, really wonderful animals. Interesting must deer. Done by Narwhaler. So now we've got our second to last animal coming. Uh, we have got the Zorilla. Also known as the Striped Polecat. It's probably a more common name. I like the Zorilla. Oh, that's like uh, a really cool name. <laughs> so, the Striped Polecat, also known as the African Polecat, the Zorilla the Cape ball cat or the African skunk. Uh, is this mustelid that resembles a skunk, but it's actually not that closely related, I don't think. So, um, 
Strut pole cats can get between 60 and 70 centimeters or 24 to 28 inches long, including their tails, about 10 to 15 centimeters tall on its shoulders by average and weigh between 1.6 and uh, 0.6 to 1.3 or 1.3 to 2.9 pounds. And generally the males are larger. And you can see they have uh, quite a varied coat depending on their location. Uh, generally they are back on the underside and white on the tail with white straps running down their body from heads down to their backs and cheeks. Sometimes they will have lighter colors and they use these markings as warnings to predators uh, and other um, things trying to attack them. So it's kind of say, hey, get out of my way. Very, very interesting. So like other mustelids, they are carnivores, so they pretty much uh, eat whatever they can. Uh, small rodents, snakes, birds, amphibians, and insects. That they must eat often because of their small stomachs and they're also just trying to find their next meal so also they are solitary and they will only associate uh other members of the species in a small family group or for the purpose of breeding they are nocturnal and they hunt mostly at night during the day they hide in the bushes and hide away and they often found in habitats with large ungulate populations because of the lower scrubs uh they graze so a lot easier to find food and um sorry we don't have babies but that's okay let's find the other one so generally they after contraception the gestation period for these guys is about four weeks or so about a month during this time the mother will prepare a nest for her offspring and the newborn polecats are completely vulnerable they're blind deaf all that and um need to be taken care of and after one to five weeks uh of the, of the offspring being born uh one to five offspring born per litter in the summer but up to six can be supported. And if food is available, the mother has six teats, so she can have th theoretically up to six babies. Uh, the mother will protect her young until they're able to survive on their own, which I assume is probably a year or two. Uh, they are very, very uh, aggressive and territorial, so they have these very, very interesting ways of defending themselves. So they use an anal spray, which they use as defensive about predators, which is very similar to how husks do it. So they have an anal stink gland, which will temporarily bind to adhesives and irritates like uh, mucus. So if it got you in the nose or something, it would really, really be irritating. And what they'll do is they'll do the stretch stance. So they'll have a noxious fluid. The striped pole cat will have like a threat, but their back arch and their rear ending face the opponent and their tail straight up in the air. Sometimes they've even been reported of standing on like handstands to try and intimidate predators, which is very, very interesting. And also what's very, very interesting is that they've been known to use all sorts of uh, verbal signals to communicate with each other. So they will use growls as a warning sign yeah. for predators and contender, uh, competitors yeah. and things like that. They also use high pitch screams, which are used to signify aggression. And they have a high low pitch scream that's used to uh, convey submissive uh, or surrendering. And yeah, it's, I think it's really interesting how they use sound to communicate. And young polecats often have a particular set of calls and signs, usually in adolescence, that show signs of distress or joy, depending on where their mother is absent, present. So that's very, very interesting. Really, really wonderful little Zorillas. How can you not love a good Zorilla? So yeah, that was done by Frazzle64. And last and most definitely not least, since I've covered this guy in Jurassic World Evolution 2, I won't go over him too much. This was made by Leaf and Johnny V. We have got the giant ground sloth, Megatherium. So this is quite small for a Megatherium, they did get elephant size, so I think this would fit for one of the many smaller um, species of ground sloth, potentially Lestodon. I think this probably fits better because it kind of looks like a smaller version of Megatherium. And Doug Big Burrow, so that's also very cool. But we will stick with the species it's named as in the mod, which is Megatherium Americanum. So Megatherium is an extinct genus of ground sloth that lived in South America during from the early Pliocene to the end of the Pleistocene, they've also been called as giant ground sloths or megatheres. They were native to the Pampas throughout southern Bolivia uh, during the Pleistocene. And they were part of the sloth family Megatheridae, which also includes animals like Arembatherium, which lived much more north. Which lived, They also lived in Florida and uh, Brazil, more than parts of the um, southern US and northern uh, South America. Very, very interesting. And they got huge. So the Megatherium and Emberatherium were some of the largest ground sloths. They were comparable in size to elephants. And really the only mammals that land mammals that got larger were elephants and giant rhinos uh, like Paraceratherium. And they were first discovered uh, 
by George Cuvier, who was like, what the heck is this? Uh, and then there's like, oh, it's a sloth. They were sent to him. And these guys being me large mega herbivores, they kind of went around, do their thing in Pampas. So they, where they lived at the time, it was much uh, drier, so it was much more of a grassland. And they were cooler as well. They were pretty large, as I mentioned. They got to about four, uh, four tons and up to six meters long from head to tail. A very, very huge, and they would, uh, had been able to graze on pretty much anything or um, browse. I think the Megatherium itself was most likely a browser, especially like woodlands and grasslands. Uh, really very interesting animals. If you want to hear more, I did like a really in-depth one for um, one of the episodes of Jurassic World. I think it was part 16 or 17, something like that, um, where they had a mod for Jurassic World Evolution. I went to detail that. It was really, really cool. Really, really wonderful. But I really do love this mod. And yeah, Megatherium... Like all other mega other ground sloths, except for the sloths we have today, they all went extinct at the end of the Pleistocene, and that's obviously a very controversial topic. There's been evidence that they've been butchered and slaughtered. Some people think it was humans, some people think it was climate, some people think it was disease, some people think it was all of the above, and it's very, very complicated and a very, very interesting debate, and it could be all of the above. And But yeah, it's a really, really interesting talk, and it's very sad these guys went extinct because they seem to have survived worse climate changes than uh what happened at the end of the place the scene so yeah sucks that we don't have them but really cool that we at least know about them now and now you're messing around with your tongue but still really really wonderful animal really cool megatherium so yeah i think this will be a very very great place to end the video so yeah i um really 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 hope you guys enjoyed this video i hope you guys like and subscribe Always remember to get the little bell icon to get notified when you love anything. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. And bye bye